All right. Good morning, everybody. Morning, morning everybody. Morning. morning. It's wonderful uh, to see you all this morning. Uh, my name is Matt Laidlaw. Um, on behalf of our team, I want to welcome you to Open Circle, whether you're joining us online um, or you are here in person. I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity to spend uh, this morning with each of you. So um, usually a couple of uh, reminders at the beginning of each gathering. Um, so let me think about what those need to be this morning. How about if you are a, if you are a, if you consider yourself a child or the parent of a child, raise your hand. Okay, real high, as high as you can. Whew, okay, all right, a few of us in here. Great. I want everyone in this room, whether you are a child or a parent of a child, or if you don't fit in either of those categories, I want you to feel invited to be in this space in whatever way feels comfortable and safe for you. So kids, um, do what you need to do. Make sure you listen to the people who brought you. Um, mom and dad, caregivers, take a deep breath. Uh, settle into this space in the ways that you need to. Um, we are trying to continue to grow as a community to embrace all of the wiggles and movements and noises as reminders of the gift um, that young people are to have in this space. So everybody, make yourself at home. Uh, next, um, uh, my friend Matt Gabriel was just telling me about something called COVID-19. He asked me if I'd heard of it. Um, and I had. Um, if you haven't, uh, you should probably do some Googling, but um, it is still happening, and um, I don't want to get too preachy about this, but I feel compelled to say that, um, you know, one in ten every uh, new COVID case over the past few days has been in the state of Michigan, and there's been a lot of information about how the healthcare systems are doing in West Michigan specifically, and things are really challenging right now. Um, so, uh, I would ask you to consider in all of your life <laughs> to do everything you can to make sure the choices you're making uh, have uh, your safety and the safety of everyone else in mind. All of the decisions we make all the time have impacts on people that we'll never know. That's always been true. Um, right now, uh, we have the chance um, to recognize that uh, in, in more clear ways probably than ever that our choices impact the people around us and we can make specific choices uh, on behalf of a common good. So. Um, as your friend, <laughs> um, as somebody who's a part of this community with you, I implore you to continue to take that seriously. And thank you in this space. Um, it's been un unbelievable to me to see um, all of us doing the simple things that we need to do to make sure this space remains as safe as possible for everyone who's here, especially the most vulnerable among us. So um, especially today, um, given... Um, the circumstances we're in, but also in the coming weeks. Please continue to wear masks if you're two years of age or older, and it's okay to give one another gentle reminders of, of that. If we see um, our own kids or the kids of others running around or our own friends who are super excited to tell us something, but they forgot they're not wearing a mask, we can gently remind, remind them to do that. We have masks on both of the welcome tables in the exhibit hall and in the hallway as well. Um, and then, uh, I guess this is like Matt being... Matt being super preachy here in the introduction or the reminders, which usually isn't the case. Um, and when I say preachy, I just mean usually try to just share a couple of pieces of helpful information and then get the gathering going. Um, but Friday, um, the verdict was announced in uh, the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse. And I'll be honest in saying that I am not as informed on the details of the incidents that took place um, that led to this trial as I would like to be. I'm not as informed about the details that emerged in this trial um, as I would like to be. But what I know is that um, several people um, are dead. And uh, Kyle had something to do with that. And here's what it feels like to me right now, based on my, this is Matt's vantage point, okay? Um, there's a good amount of people who are grieving the fact that uh, Kyle was acquitted of all charges. Um, and there's a good amount of people who are celebrating this. Um, there's a number of people, a lot of people, who believe that Kyle is a cold-blooded white supremacist uh, murderer. And there are other people in the country who um, have already, you know, set it up on YouTube TV to record Tucker Carlson on Monday night to watch Kyle's interview on Fox News um, as part of a 
sort of, some sort of like celebration or vindication of all this. Um, what's true is that both of those things are happening right now. Um, Kyle was 17 years old um, when he killed two people with an automatic weapon that he was carrying in public. A 17-year-old. Is he a child? Is he a man? Um, he's a human being. Uh, 17 years old. How does a 17-year-old get involved in something like that the way that he did? But I believe that this kind of violence and the violence that surrounds this kind of violence is a symptom of the story's separateness that we're all living in, that we've been talking about the past several months. Whether they be political, whether they be racial, whether they be religious, and yes, white supremacy, systemic racism, police brutality, a biased and unjust criminal justice system, all of it can condemn it. I condemn it. We can keep talking about these things. We have explicitly for the past several years. Um, but this is just one of the many things that keep happening. Like, we know about this story because it's been so publicized. There are things um, like this Bigger and smaller happening every day in the lives of people in our community and around our country. This like cycle of violence, I think, has engulfed us, and it's not going to get any better until we can all work together towards solutions um, that don't keep perpetuating the story of separateness that leads to this sort of thing. Um, we have to keep learning how to practice withness together, right? Like, we have to keep learning how to live in different stories and practice different ways of being together if we want this to be any different, if we want to stop waking up to these sorts of events and these sorts of responses to these events. Um, so I'll say it again. Get involved. Get involved in the big stuff. Policy, protest, ideology, debates, get involved, get informed, engage one another. Like, we have to do that in the ways that we can. Devote yourself to a path and a process. Figure out what that looks like for you and invite all of us to join you. We have to do that. And take care of yourself. Devote yourself to your own path of growth, to your own process of waking up to living in a different sort of story where we're not, li we're not living in this sort of violence anymore. Get on the yoga mat. Get on the meditation pillow. Pray. Read. Get outside. Breathe. Whatever you need to do to keep growing in this way. Get, in the big, get involved in the big stuff and keep working on the small stuff. But also, <laughs> we have to keep figuring out what it looks like for us to get involved in this like other sort of space. That's not just the big stuff and not just the small stuff, but is a group of people who are willing to say, these people, this time, this moment, right now, all of us together, we're going to try and figure out how to work these things out. And it might seem small. It might just feel like 20 people or 40 people or 90 people in a room making small changes along the way. And it might feel like, how are we ever going to address this big stuff or the big problems we're facing? I'm more convinced than ever that if we're ever going to move the needle on any of that, it's going to have to be in a space like this. So we're going to keep trying to do that together, very imperfectly, but with that naive hope in mind that a more loving world is possible, and it's going to have to start here. With each of us, right now, working it out together. So that's what we're going to do this morning. Sound okay? Okay. All right. Or let's just like end right now because it feels like we just had a little bit of church and probably just go all downhill from here. No, it'll be great. This morning, uh, we've got some, uh, some fun things uh, planned. In a moment, um, I'll get us started with an opening practice. Um, our friend, Matt Gabriel, is joining us once again to offer some music. Matt and his family have been a, a part of our community for a long time. It's wonderful to see you this morning. Really, really glad uh, that you're here. Um, Abby Black will be sharing a story for all ages, and then I will do another teaching, not the COVID teaching and not the Kyle Rittenhouse teaching, but I've got another teaching planned, um, and I'll do that at the end of our gathering. Sound okay? Okay. So, um, 
Yeah, let's uh, get started with our opening practice. So um, each week uh, at Open Circle, we begin by sharing just a few moments of quiet and silence together. Um, usually we'll have a prayer or a reading from scripture or a poem that will be shared, and then we'll hold two minutes of silence together uh, marked by the ringing of a bell. So I'll read something, I'll ring the bell, two minutes of quiet, I'll ring the bell, and then we'll continue with our gathering together. Um, this space um, is an invitation to be whatever you need it to be in this moment, um, but it's intended to be an opportunity for each of us to do whatever we need to do to just be here right now, to find our footing for this engagement with one another in this community. Um, for me, in order to find that, it means trying to slow down my brain a little bit, all the things on my to-do list that I've got to do later on today or that I'm worried about, or concerned about. It's putting both feet on the ground. For me, it's uncrossing my arms and legs, taking some, some deep breaths. So I would invite you to do that. Find a, a space wherever you are that communicates openness to yourself and to one another and to God. Take some deep breaths. Become mindful of your breathing. Hear these words from David White. This poem is called Loaves and Fishes. And I'm going to read it twice. This is not the age of information. This is not the age of information. Forget the news and the radio and the blurred screen. This is the time of loaves and fishes. People are hungry, and one good word is bread for a thousand. This is not the age of information. This is not the age of information. Forget the news and the radio and the blurred screen. This is the time of loaves and fishes. People are hungry, and one good word is bread for a thousand. Thanks, everybody. 
So music has always been a beautiful and vital part of our experience together at Open Circle. And we've engaged with music in multiple different ways throughout our story together. Um, sometimes we participate through listening. Sometimes we participate by singing. Sometimes we participate by moving. Sometimes it's a combination of all of those things. Um, but regardless of, of the experience each morning, the invitation remains the same, uh, to participate with open hearts uh, and with open minds. And this morning, um, I'm very excited that our friend uh, Matt Gabriel is joining us as our guest musician. So I like his bio. You know I'm a fan of clever bios, so I'm just going to share his bio. Matt Gabriel is a singer-songwriter who has spent over a decade writing and performing music around the country. The quality of folk and blues you would expect from an artist who grew up between sh Chicago and Detroit. He's got a must-see live show and a very approachable recorded sound. It's music you can trust and believe in. Matt, we trust in and believe in you. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Let's welcome Matt Gabriel. <laughs> Thank you. I don't, I don't get that at home, so I appreciate that. <laughs> this is a song called Big Sur, about a little town in California. Feel, I feel the earth, feel it below, below my own, my own two feet. It's cold, it's cold and soaked, soaked from rain. To be blissful, claiming I command the birds and the bees. Kind of hope that only grows in the forest, not fenced in. You're never gonna fence it in. Not fenced in. Scratch the surface, not fenced in. You're never going to fence it in. Not fenced in. Machines. 
send them away For they Oh, they have just They have just begun They've only begun They've begun the wrecking Ooh, It's in the air that I breathe And it's in my marrow A taste that's grown metallic on my tongue and I've been kissing you like it's some odd form of currency Not fenced in, never gonna fence it in Not fenced in, never gonna fence it in Not fenced in, you're never gonna fence it in Not fenced in Thank you. So happy to be back uh, with this community. Different room than uh, where I left you, but it doesn't matter. Church can be anywhere, right? We, uh, everybody gave up a lot of things, stopped a lot of routines. Uh, during, you know, the pandemic for the last couple of years, but uh, Open Circle was something that we, uh, my wife Shay and I just, just got, Feel like we got the groove into before everything started to fall apart so we we, we missed this uh, it was on the top of our list of, of things that uh, we miss doing or at least attending so um, happy that uh, things are getting back into the swing of it so and we had a, we had a baby over the pandemic so it was like your world gets flipped upside down and then the pandemic like flips it again you know what I mean? But it didn't flip it right side up. I guess it's a bad metaphor. <laughs> so, anyways, it was. Uh, it's nice to to start to pull things in that you're that you're looking forward to or you got used to. So, it's a brand new song of mine called "The Lonely Hearts Club." Hear the harbor, see the people laughing down by the shore. I feel the city start to wake. I thought I saw you on a subway platform waiting for your usual train. Some hearts sometimes after all is said and done away they won't heal with time. Oh, when you're left with so much more to say, because I got good love, but nobody else will do. Because I just don't think that I ever want to. Over you, get yeah, over you. I'm turning on sight and sound. I grab a coffee and a paper and I watch the traffic pile up downtown. I'm staying on a certain street. Take a different way to work each day so I don't see the place we used to meet. Oh, and all those memories. I guess some hearts, sometimes, after all said and done away. When 
you left with so much more to say Because I got good love but nobody else will do Because I just don't think that I ever want to Get over you Get over you I feel the distance from that day You said you'd never meant to break my heart in two But like they say, a spade's a spade No matter how it's held or played Holding on, what good's that gonna do? Because if I hold on, you're never really gone and a part of you stays if I stay holding on. Oh, I got good love, but nobody else will do. Oh, you see, I got good love, but nobody else will do. Because I just don't think that I ever want to. Over you. Whoa. Da -da 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 -da. Only Hearts Club. Thank you. It's nice, I, uh, I make a living to playing music, but I, you gotta play a lot of bars and stuff like that around here, at least at my, my level, and uh, some of these tunes are saved specifically for kind of shows like this, so it's nice to have a little bit of change of pace. I was playing like a whiskey bar last night in Ann Arbor, which was a blast, but you can't play a lot of some of the down, down like, you know, quieter, mellower stuff, so I like being able to, I look forward to this stuff, because you have an audience that's paying attention, which is always nice, uh, and everybody's hopefully sober at this time of day, you know, but it's also nice to, to be able to, these songs have a special place, and they, you know, you don't want to write everything that needs a special audience, because you're, you know, I just feel like that, uh, that was always tough for me, because I feel like I would never get to play them, so, anyways, this is another one of those, so. This is a song for my daughter, Evelyn. Um, when I started it, because of how special your kids are to you, you never know and nobody can explain it to you because how could you explain something like that to somebody that doesn't, hasn't experienced it, you know? So when you finally, you know, meet your kid and you see him for the first time, it's, I don't know, it's, it's really incredible. And it, it made me, you know, it's almost like a it's almost like a crush. Remember in high school when you had a crush on somebody? You just think they're so great and everything they say is so funny and it's like that's as close as I can explain it to somebody, any of my bachelor buddies <laughs> that uh, don't ask, I just, just tell them. So anyway, she's so special to me that when I started writing this song I was nervous about making it bad, screwing it up because of how special she is to me. I was like this better be good. <laughs> so it took me a long time to finish, so. I've never had that pressure before in a song, so. It's called Ring That Bell. When I see you for the first time And you take that breath that you took away from me Simply amazing, both you and your mother as the both of you, you drift on off to sleep The moment's finally here you Waited for so long Couldn't wait to meet you Now it seems you're right where you belong So go and ring that bell There's so much to see Go on and ring that bell Who knows 
is what you could achieve. Oh, you'll never know if you never try. If you listen, oh, I can show you how your letters work and how to spell your name. Just be patient, and I'll teach you how to check the time and how to tell your age, and how to count your change. Maybe you write a song. I know that you just arrived. Soon you'll grow up and just be moving on. that bell there's so much to see go on and ring that bell who knows what you could achieve oh you'll never know if you never try welcome to the world we make the ups and downs the give and take here here on earth Welcome to the starting line, the place you're from, your given time. I promise you the love that you deserve. The love that you deserve. So go on, ring that bell. There's so much to see. When the road has been too long and the weight's too much to bear And you just can't take another step That's when you're halfway there You never need to go alone, I promise Yeah, we'll both be by your side Be by your side Bring that bell. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks uh, for having me and listening. Matt, that was beautiful. Thanks for sharing with us this morning. Let's thank Matt one more time. <laughs> At Open Circle, uh, we share stories for all ages, stories for both the young and the young at heart. Uh, and this morning, our story will be shared by our friend, Abby Black. So if you are young or you are young at heart, I want to invite you to come up on stage, either by scaling the wall or coming up these stairs right here and finding a place to sit for our story. You're not going to be able to see if you sit there. Uh, thanks, Matt, for making me cry before this. So. <laughs> All right. so. Hey. Sit down by Isla, please. All right, well, we'll get started. Rosie, sit down by Isla, please. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're going to read a very special story today, but first we're going to hit the singing bowl so we can practice getting quiet in our bodies and ready to listen with our hearts and with our ears, okay? The book I brought with me today and the story is called The Magical Yet, and Angela Di Terralizzi wrote the words for us, and Lorena Alvarez drew the pictures for us. It's a really beautiful book, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show the pictures for a long time. There are days when your dreams haven't come true, or you're upset by the things you can't do. If you've lost or failed or cried just a bit, 
You're tired of waiting, ready to quit. Like that shiny new bike you couldn't ride, and it didn't matter how hard you tried. You couldn't pedal, and you couldn't steer, and you couldn't get that bike into gear. Then when you thought you were on the right track, you popped a wheelie and fell on your back. That has happened to me before. And now you won't ride. No way. Not never. No riding for you. You'll walk forever. Don't give up now. There's a major game changer, a most amazing thought rearranger, somehow, or someone to show you how good you can get now introducing the magical yet. Isn't she beautiful? With this yet's magic, you can begin to see that you're going beyond where you've been. There are so many things that you've learned to do when you didn't know the yet was with you, like when you babbled before you could talk or how you crawled before you could walk. Yet's a dreamer, a schemer, a hoper, a trier, a maker, a doer, a gotta fly higher. This yet finds a way even when you don't and yet knows you will when you think you won't. Like that shiny new bike that you couldn't ride? Hop right back on with the yet by your side. Yet doesn't mind warm-ups, fixes and flops, do-overs, redos, stumbles and stops. Yet knows there's mistakes, some big and some small, with yet you're sure to get over them all. Play the kazoo or play the bassoon. Jam with the yet and you'll soon be in tune. Try skateboarding tricks like the ollie heel flip. This yet can get to the championship. Tongue twisters twisted your tongue in a knot, yet says keep trying and practice a lot. Do you see all of them have their own yet? Yeah. Be patient, yet can't do it all overnight. Some things take days, months, or years to get right. But if you keep leaping, dreaming, wishing, waiting, learning, trying, missing, with the yes, your guide along the way, you'll do all the things you can't do today. Now you're bolder, braver, starting to see with the yet you can get where you want to be. What's she doing? She's crying. You finally did it, yet knew you could. You're not just riding, you're getting quite good. But don't stop now, you've got so much to do. The good news is the yet grows with you. So no matter how big or old you may get, you'll never outgrow, you'll never forget. You can always believe in the magic of yet. The end. Thank you for being great listeners. If you have an orange bracelet on, you can follow. I don't know who it is. You can follow. I can't tell who you are. Him. Follow the orange sign to your room. Let's go. All right. Um, we, in a moment, we're going to uh, practice something together um, that we've just been calling standing circles. And this is a very brief practice that will involve us engaging one another a bit. Um, it'll be completely optional. You don't have to participate if you don't, don't want to or don't feel comfortable this morning doing that. I'll give instructions in a second for that. Uh, but first, I want to say that uh, this morning, 
Um, we're going to be, this is such a funny thing to say on Sunday morning, um, we're going to be using a little more God language than normal, or at least a little more intentional God language than normal. And uh, I want to say that one of the things that I love most about this community is that there is an openness to engaging one another in such a way that recognizes that that word um, can mean a lot and also mean nothing (laughs) to all of us and in different ways or maybe both at the same time, either because um, the word God is used to point to or symbolize so many different things that it's sort of lost its meaning in our society or in our lives, or because for many of us the word God has been associated with a lot of disappointment, hurt, pain, trauma, whatever it might be. Um, And for some of us, the word God might not even be a word that helps us make meaning of our own spiritual um, or religious experience of life. And all of that belongs here in some way. Um, So however you hold that word, um, I want you to feel invited to hold it that way. And one of the prompts during um, our standing circle will involve that word. And I would just invite you to not think about like what the Sunday morning answer should be, but to think about the answer for you. And I'm saying all of that now because when I use the word God, when I'm trying to explain some things after this practice, every time I say it, I'm not going to give that qualifier. I'm not going to say God, mystery, divine, reality, whatever it might be for you. I'm not going to say that every time, but I want you to know that the, my use of the word God this morning is, is hopefully um, has a broad enough embrace to include all of those things, um, at least in the ways that, that you might make sense of the word God. Sound okay? Okay, all right. So um, we practice something called standing circles at Open Circle, um, which is just an opportunity for us, again, to find our footing in this gathering and to see and hear one another, see and hear other human beings in this space around some of the things um, that we value in our community. So in a moment, I'm going to invite all of us to stand up, if you're willing and if you're able, um, and find uh, little groups of three or four in this room. Ideally, a a group of people that maybe you've never met before or that aren't a part of your household that you can come here with. And the invitation in that space, it'll be about six minutes long, is uh, to speak from the heart, listen from the heart, without saying too much, say just enough, Uh, respect one another, which means only one person will speak at a time, and trust the process of the practice. So you'll find um, groups of three or four people, you'll enter in with these intentions, and then each of you, one at a time, will have an opportunity to respond to these prompts. So share your name and what your theme song is today. Get creative. Uh, Complete this phrase, today I am grateful for. And then, what words or images might you use to share your experience, understanding, and or imagination of God? So this isn't like your testimony or whatever, or like some theological treatise. It's just just a few words or images that might be meaningful to you, as you might try to to explain um, or share your understanding, experience, or imagination of God. So, you'll get in your groups of three or four. Each of you will have the chance to respond to the first prompt, each of you do the second prompt, then each of you do the third prompt. If you don't want to participate in this practice, that's totally fine. You can signify that you're not looking for a group by remaining seated or going for a short walk for a few minutes, whatever makes sense for you. Um, But we'll do this um, for about six minutes or so. Okay? All right, so I invite you to stand up if you're willing and able and you want to participate in this practice and to move about the room to find two or three other people Um, to share in this conversation with. And please be inclusive of people of all ages and look for others who may be standing around but don't have a group yet.
Okay, we're going to take about two more minutes, so um, make sure everybody gets a chance to respond. And if your group is finished, or when you're finished, you can have a seat to let us know that we're ready to move on. All right, friends, I would invite you to finish the sentence or the phrase that you're sharing right now and then find a seat. It always feels a little unfair from my vantage point to invite us into this experience with such a limited amount of time around some meaningful questions because with the right group of people and with these intentions, these conversations could last for hours, right? So I'd invite you if, you know, your group was getting somewhere or you want to hear or share more, you know, find each other um, after the gathering and, and continue the conversation um, if you're interested and if it's helpful. So thanks for being willing to, to lend your presence uh, to one another, to that practice, to this practice this morning. Um, okay, so this is week seven of us being back in person after 18 months of um, being online because of COVID. Uh, this is week number six um, in a series that we are calling Practicing With. And uh, the idea of this conversation is that we are trying to situate ourselves at the intersection of ancient wisdom, the teachings of Jesus, in the science of relationships, so that we can try and rediscover the lost art of practicing with, practicing with ourselves, practicing with one another, practicing with the earth and the cosmos, and practicing with God. Uh, this morning, um, I want to begin uh, with a short little passage um, from the New Testament uh, written by the Apostle John. Uh, John was one of Jesus' uh, disciples. He probably was only around 10 years old, maybe even a little bit younger, um, when he was following Jesus around for the three years that he did. And later in John's life, um, he writes uh, these words in a book that we call 1 John. But in 1 John chapter 4, verse 12, John says this, No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. No one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen God. The dude who followed Jesus around for three years says emphatically here, no one has ever seen God. No one. This uh, short statement, I think, points to one of the most foundational aspects of Christianity, and, uh, and I'm most experienced with Christianity, but also my limited understanding of both Judaism and Islam, uh, this passage points to this foundational aspect of the Christian faith that is God is a mystery. God is mystery. No one has ever seen God. 
the person who followed Jesus around for three years and is writing letters and books and devoting his whole life to God or the mystery of God is saying, but nobody's ever actually seen God. God is mystery. And it's important to point out here, I think I, I mentioned this this past summer at one of our online gatherings, that a mystery isn't something that we can't know. A mystery is something that we can endlessly know. Or a mystery isn't something that we can't understand. Oh, it's a mystery. I guess we'll never know. No, 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 no. It's a mystery, which means we can endlessly be understanding what and who and how that is. And a foundational aspect of orthodox, historic Christianity is that whatever we mean by the word God, the who and the what and how of God, nobody's ever seen God. God is a mystery. And this mystery is something that we can endlessly know and endlessly understand. Now, I think this idea runs sort of like smack against sort of like the role of religion in our society right now or maybe many of our experiences of religion or traditional religion, because it seems like the primary role of religion in our society right now isn't to explore endless mystery with the humility to say, like, yes, we've got some opinions and convictions, but nobody's ever seen this God. It seems like the primary role is to provide certainty, to provide answers, to provide truth and perspective on What's right? What's wrong? Who's in? Who's out? They get it. We don't. Here are the boundaries. Here are the answers. Here is what this is supposed to look like. But I wonder, (laughs) in a society that says the role of religion is to provide certainty, what it might look like to reclaim the idea that one of the fundamental gifts that religion is to offer is is to provide practices in space to explore the everlasting, knowable mystery of God. What if we approach our religion and spirituality from a perspective of endless knowing and discovery and exploration rather than a bounded group of ideas and facts and knowledge and certainty? This, for me, is why even conversations about beliefs or doctrines or dogmas can be really troubling. For myself, I'll say uh, in my own life, uh, that way of practicing religion and spirituality is increasingly becoming irrelevant for me. Not in a, like, judgmental sort of way, but in a way like it just doesn't actually make sense for my life. That way of encountering meaning and reality and existence and the depth of experience that I've had in my life, that way of understanding God isn't really working for me anymore. And I suspect for many of us, it might even be part of why we're here in this space together, it's because for us the, exper- the depth of experience we've had, our own understanding or experience of God is leading us to a space to where we want freedom to explore and discover and endlessly know the mystery of life and reality and existence and God. What that doesn't mean, however, is that conversations about belief or convictions don't matter. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be trying to creatively figure out how to, how to carve out space to have those sorts of conversations with one another. Because to say, like, well, certainty isn't part of my religion or spirituality and God is a mystery doesn't mean, well, we shouldn't be trying to endlessly converse and dialogue about that mystery together as well. So a phrase for me that has become really helpful around this is the idea of God imagination. I don't mean to say that God's imaginary (laughs) or that anything that we're talking about related to faith or God or the soul um, is from our imagination. But to say that however we're perceiving God is coming from our own limited vantage point. It has to do with the beliefs and traditions we were given as a child. It has to do with our own experiences of joy or suffering, pain, trauma, hope, all of it bounded together. It has to do with our own passions and the things that we're interested in. And all of that works together to create a perspective that we might have about the mystery of God. 
So the phrase God imagination is a way of capturing, okay, well, how is it that you imagine God? What is your God imagination? How are you making meaning of the mystery of life, the mystery of reality? What is your God imagination? And for me, asking that question feels completely different than somebody asking me, what do you believe? What do you believe versus what is your God imagination accesses a completely different part of my being? All of a sudden, it's like I, I might have a response that's coming from a different part of my body than right here. Or it doesn't necessarily trigger a fight-or-flight response because sometimes when people ask me what I might believe about something, I know, okay, I better give these answers if I want this conversation to end before lunch and if I want these people to be friends with me in the future. But, Matt, what's your God imagination? It's like an invitation into freedom, an invitation into exploration, an invitation into the mystery of God that we can be endlessly knowing and understanding. So I'll just ask it right here, and I'll ask it again in a few minutes. Friends, what is your God imagination? What is your God imagination? Um, About 20 years ago, um, a group of researchers from around the country um, set out to uh, complete the largest research study on the religious and spiritual lives of young people in the United States that had ever been completed. Um, It eventually became known as the National Study of Youth and Religion. Um, There were people from Notre Dame, Princeton involved, um, and they started with teenagers, and then they decided, we're just going to keep following these young people into adulthood. And it wasn't just Christian young people, it was people from all faith traditions in the United States trying to understand what is it that these young people practice? What is it that they believe? And I would impose my own language on it, is they were really trying to capture the God imagination of a generation in our country. And they followed those young people who are now well into their 30s um, over the past several decades. What they discovered that regardless of if they were talking to Muslim young people um, or Mormon young people or charismatic Christian young people or Roman Catholic young people, all of them in the United States, what they discovered was that there weren't really um, meaningful differences between all of those specific groups. It was like if you put all of those different traditions this way, there was something that cut across all of them that they found in them and said the, the God imagination of these people is actually something completely different than the traditions that they're in, but it's similar across all of the traditions. And they didn't say that this is like some, or some sort of like new secret religion that like young people were practicing. What they said was that there is a common imagination. There is a common imagination among this generation of people in our country regardless of faith tradition. And they bundle, you know, I'm not a researcher, but they did all the stuff with data and responses and algorithms and formulas to bundle it all together and then try and make meaning of it. And these were the words they'd use to describe the God imagination of this generation of people in the United States. They called it moralistic therapeutic deism. Depending on your temperament, that may be really a really exciting phrase to explore, or maybe I just lost you for the rest of the time. Um, Please come back. They called this moralistic therapeutic deism. And here's how they explained it. The God imagination of this generation in the United States is simply that whoever or whatever God is, God wants me to be good. God wants me to feel good. But unless it has anything to do with those first two points, God's not involved in life in any sort of meaningful way. God wants me to be good. God wants me to feel good. And God is, God is not involved. And the researcher said, this is the God imagination of this generation. This is the, the religious perspective of this generation. A couple of points to make about this. If you're familiar with any relig- religious tradition, um, you came from a tradition or you've studied any of it, you probably would say, this doesn't feel like reflective necessarily of like the depth of my own religious exploration or spirituality. Like, I feel like there's more there. Um, Like, this doesn't seem like 
the best part of Judaism or the best part of Islam or the best part of Roman Catholicism or Protestant Christianity. And I think that's probably accurate. Like this doesn't feel like it fits in any of those containers, yet somehow it cuts across all of them as the predominant religious imagination. Uh, The second piece that I think is helpful to point out is that after these decades of research, what they've been able to sort of come to some conclusions on is that, hey, this isn't just the the, uh, God imagination of the people we studied as teenagers. They didn't really grow out of this as they got older. In fact, they sort of became more entrenched in it. A lot of these people are, now have families of their own or careers of their own. They're, they're grown up. And what we've discovered is this is just pretty much true of all people in the United States, that when you really boil it down, the predominant God imagination or religious perspective or God consciousness that exists in our society is God wants me to be good, God wants me to feel good, And God is otherwise not involved in our lives. Now, I don't want to make any, like, judgments about, like, whether this is, like, a good thing or a bad thing. That's not really the point of this. The point of it is this just is. This is what the research has reflected back to us. But I think this might be helpful for us in diagnosing some of the things we've been talking about, um, over the past six or seven weeks together, and diagnosing some of the problems that we're facing in our own lives and as a society. Because if the primary God imagination of our society is simply moralistic, therapeutic, and deistic, I wonder how that lines up with some of the other tools that we've been talking about together. And I I want us to, for lack of a better word, evaluate that together. If this is our God imagination, how does this fit with what we've been talking about in terms of relationships? If you haven't been with us the past few weeks, if this is your first time joining us, I'll give a brief summary of this. I'm sorry that you're sort of joining in a conversation that has been sort of happening already, but I, I think it'll be okay. Just hang with us. What we've been talking about is this idea that something called restorative practices, the science of relationships, the studying of how people have built community and resolved conflict for hundreds, if not thousands of years, has been distilled into a very specific tool to help us understand what health and growth and transformation can look like. And it's this idea that if on one axis you have a high level of accountability and control in a relationship or an environment, and on another axis you have a high level of support, encouragement, nurture, and empathy on, on the other axis. The higher you go this way, increase in control. High, the more to the right you go, increase in support. We can begin to frame an understanding of what our relationships and environments look like. So high control, low support is something called a two relationship or a punitive relationship. High support, low control looks like a permissive or a four relationship. Low control, low support, looks neglectful. We would call that a not relationship. But spaces, environments, relationships, communities that are high on control, accountability, limit setting, boundaries, and also high on support, encouragement, nurture, empathy, love, both of those things we call a restorative relationship or a restorative space. And it's not to say that these other ones are inherently bad. It's just to say that where does transformation happen? Where does restoration happen? Like, where is the sweet spot in relationships, in environments, and in spirituality? What does it look like? It looks like something over here. This is where change actually occurs, where change most effectively occurs. So if the primary God imagination of our society is something like, God wants me to be good, God wants me to feel good, God is not involved, let's evaluate that together. The perspective that God wants me to be good, God has rules to follow and I'm supposed to follow them, where might that fit in this window? Two? I think so. God has rules to follow, you're held accountable to them, so you better be good. Without question, I think that is a punitive or two understanding of God or imagination of God. What about... God wants me to feel good. High on support, encouragement, 
nurture, love, right? God, and I think you can expand on the, the God wants me to feel good being this sort of like imagination of God is like, God's going to fight all my battles. God's going to take care of all my problems. God um, is going to bless me. And I think the way these things work together is God's going to do these things for me if I'm good, right? God wants me to be good. And if I, uh, if I am good, then God's going to help me feel good. And then what about the like, but other than these two things, God's not really involved <laughs> in life in any sort of meaningful way. I think that's neglectful. Or what you could call deism, a belief in a God of some kind, but a, a, a distant God, a God that's not involved in any sort of meaningful way in our lives or in our existence. Now, I'm not doing this to be critical, though I hope we're thinking critically about this. I'm not doing this to judge anything. I'm simply offering this to say, this is like the waters we're swimming in, in religion, in spirituality. This is the primary God imagination of society. And if we use this tool as a way of trying to make sense of it, what we can recognize is that the primary God imagination of our society is punitive, permissive, and neglectful, but probably isn't inhabiting a restorative or transformative space in any sort of meaningful way for many people who are exploring the mystery of God or a part of any sort of religious or spiritual community. I think for those of us who grew up in a Christian environment, I think this was probably explicitly taught to us in some way, right? Like, God wants you to be good. There's rules to follow, and guess what? You can't do it. You're not good enough. So being good is the goal, but also you can't do it. But don't worry. God is somehow so angry at you, but also loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus to do it for you. Jesus took care of the problem for you. And if there is any language around, like, God being with in any sort of meaningful way, it was only to solve this, this math problem. That, like, you can't do this. God's going to take care of it for you. So it's like this, like, whoop, brief, like, drive-through on the with restorative space, but it's only to solve this problem. And then we're sort of, like, left with the conundrum of, like, okay, but, like, what are we supposed to do now that God fixed this for us? Well, I guess just keep trying to be good and to tell other people to be good and believe in how good we are and our beliefs are and, and that sort of thing. Again, not trying to be judgmental or critical, trying to just name it in a way that we might be able to make sense of it. For some of us, this is the waters we've been swimming in. For some of us, this is what we were explicitly taught. A couple of like ways that this sort of God imagination, I think, can work into our daily lives that have implications for what it might look like to practice with is that this sort of, especially the moralistic and therapeutic aspect of it, the like God is punitive and God is permissive or God does things to me and God does things for me, like that way of imagining God emphasizes separateness. You're right here. God's over here. God does stuff to you or God does stuff for you and maybe sometimes you do stuff for God too, but there is separateness. It emphasizes separateness between whatever or whoever God is and whatever and whoever you are as a human being. Second, it emphasizes separateness, but I think it also emphasizes transaction. It makes this entire God imagination is an equation, as I already mentioned. It's a problem to be solved in some way. And you're not good enough, but God took care of it for you. So if you do the right things and keep trying to be good and trust that God did it for you, then you're going to get things in the end. And rather than something happening to you, like eternal conscious torment and hell, um, God's going to do something for you and allow you to have eternity in heaven someday after you die. It emphasizes separateness, and it makes our God imagination, at best, this like cosmic transaction that happens between God and human beings. I can't help but think that this has something to do with the problems we're facing as individuals and as a society. 
these stories of separateness that we're living in has something to do with our God imagination. This is like what we understand about the depths of reality and meaning into the universe is just be good and feel good and, you know, God's not really involved in any other sort of meaningful way. A couple of proposals for what this could mean for us as we keep trying to practice with, and I'm going to do it again. I thought I was going to make it through without doing it, without doing it again. Ways we can practice with, with one another. Try not to string those two words together. Sorry for those sitting in the splash zone up here. Practicing with, with one another. A couple of proposals. First, um, Father Gregory Boyle, an amazing human being, not just because of how he thinks and what he teaches, but because of the work he's doing in Southern California. People tend to imitate the kind of God they believe in. Or I'd say people tend to imitate the sort of God they imagine. If you imagine a God that punishes, if you imagine a God that wants you to be good and is going to do something to you if you're not, then I suspect you're going to become that sort of person. Why are statistically so many Christians supportive of the death penalty? Pro-life Christians, supportive of the death penalty. I think it has something to do with our God imagination. If you aren't good, you get punished. That's how the universe works. So that's how we are going to take care of and solve problems. Problem is, it's not restorative. The problem is... (laughs) If you've tried this with your kids or in any of your other relationships, it might solve problems in the short term, but it can create a whole bunch of other problems in the long run. If you imagine a God who punishes, you're probably going to be the sort of person who punishes. In my own life, I've experienced some of the like most profoundly absurd interactions with other Christians. Stories that you wouldn't believe if I told you. Someday I will tell them when we're in a space where we can laugh about them and learn from them. And I've still got a lot of work to do in my own sort of understanding of what took place and in my own healing. But I'm at a point where I can experience empathy because people were able to treat me that way because that's how they think God treats them. They think God hates them. There are a number of people in our society for whom their God imagination is that God hates them or God is just waiting for God's pound of flesh when they screw up. So of course, that's how they're going to treat others and resolve problems when they come up. What is your God imagination? Because you're probably imitating it in some way. Next, my other favorite father. Jesus didn't come to change God's mind about us, but to change our minds about God. Changing our perception of God has the potential to change everything. Jesus didn't come to change God's mind about us, but to change our minds about God. Whatever your God imagination is, or whatever our collective God imagination is, or whatever it was 2,000 years ago, and whatever you might say or believe or think about Jesus or whatever you've been taught, I would humbly submit that I think Jesus' primary motivation with everything he did and with everything he taught was to change people's minds away from toxic religion. Was to expand, enhance, transform the God imagination of the people he encountered. And I know that even the word Jesus can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people, some good and some bad. The reason I still identify with the Christian faith in any sort of way is because I wholeheartedly believe this. 
And I would say that if you're looking for a new place to start or a way to try and become aware of what your God imagination is, I would start simply with the life and teachings of Jesus. Not what other people think it means. Just the red letters in the New Testament. Some of the simple stories about him. Because what's true about Jesus is true about God. What's true about Jesus is true about the nature of reality. Those simple teachings in those simple stories have the ability to transform our imagination. And if we can transform our imagination of God, it might transform our entire lives. And then last, I've said, I think I said this just about two years ago in our community. God is mystery. Explore the mystery forever. We're never going to get to the bottom of it. But what does it mean? <laughs> like what, what, what could the mystery mean? The meaning of the mystery is love. What does John say in that passage that we started with at the very beginning? No one has ever seen God. No one's ever seen God. God's a mystery. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. There's a whole lot of withness going on in that passage. There's a whole lot of with right there. No one's ever seen God. God's a mystery. But if I love you, and you love me, then God lives in me, and God lives in you, and God lives in us, and somehow the mystery is made complete. Whatever your God imagination is, whatever our God imagination is, however we access these tools, however we grow in our own awareness, however we take steps forward, whatever we think about Kyle Rittenhouse, whoever we voted for, whoever we love, whatever happened to us, whatever we believe, all of it, part of it, it's part of the mystery. It's part of exploring the meaning of life in the mystery of God. But for us together, if we can hold those things loosely, if we can love one another, then somehow the mystery is present and God lives in us. God lives in you and God lives in me. If you're willing and if you're able, uh, please stand uh, with me. A uh, couple of brief reminders before we close our gathering. We haven't talked about money in a while. Um, one of the most remarkable things about this community throughout the pandemic is that giving has remained steady, if not gradually increased throughout the pandemic. So compared to <laughs> a lot of other communities, we're doing really, really well right now. So if you look right now, um, our income throughout the year um, has us uh, just about $8,000 short of our 2021 budget um, because of venue changes and in-person gatherings and the way expenses are going to play out in the course of the fiscal year, um, we're projecting that by December 31st, we'll have a $15,000 shortfall in our budget. Um, this is not an emergency. We have a cash reserve. Um, we can keep paying the bills. However, um, we're going to try and set a goal of having this shortfall be zero by the end of, of the 2021 year so that um, that cash reserve can remain for emergencies and so that we can keep planning for this next year from a place of stability and possibility and imagination because the past seven weeks have been really inspiring about what this community is continuing to be together and what it can continue to be and I think we have work that we can continue to, to do together. We're going to talk more about that in the coming weeks. You'll get an email after Thanksgiving about it but I just wanted to give a little bit of a primer. Here's where we're at. So thank you for everyone who's given, um, whether it was once or every week, thank you. Every little bit counts. Um, and our story together continues to remain really unlikely and remarkable. So thank you. And then uh, other quick reminders. Um, still need a handful of volunteers every week. Um, we have a few people who are serving a lot or serving every week, doing a lot of things. If a few more people chipped in, it would lighten the load a lot. You can do that at opencirclecommunity.org slash volunteer. Talk to Andrea in the exhibit hall. Um, there's a couple sign-up sheets as well for different roles. 
Um, we are a, degage, deg, a drop-off site for Degage Ministries now. Um, there's a list of things that if you bring them in and dump them in the black bucket, we'll make sure they get to Degage. Last week, we got a handful of items. Um, there's like a big bag of shampoo and soap. I brought it there Wednesday afternoon, and they immediately brought it up the elevator to the place where um, patrons were showering because they needed it. So this is like an actual need um, that we can meet together. Uh, there's no gathering next Sunday. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving and a wonderful weekend. We'll be back on the 5th. Uh, Porch Light and Lex Cummings um, will be doing some music and a guided meditation. I'll be teaching. Um, if you don't receive our monthly email, go to our website, um, share your email and name with us so that you can get all of those updates. The more people who get that email, the less I have to give those updates um, every week. Uh, don't forget, if you left child, your children here, you should pick them up after this gathering, and you should do that before you get coffee or treats. And then, in about 15 minutes, if you want to help us clean up, um, bring some items downstairs. That is always greatly appreciated. Okay? All right. For blessing, sending, benediction, um, I would invite you, um, if you're willing, to maybe open your hands in front of you, close your eyes, and receive these words. My Open Circle family, this week may you know what is real. May you believe that neither life nor death, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of the universe will ever be able to separate you from the love of God. And may you have peace. Peace be with you, my friends. Have a wonderful week. See you soon.